The Sermon on the Mount is perhaps the most well-known teaching of Jesus in Scripture. In this sermon, Jesus teaches a multitude that is gathered to him. He teaches them the perfect, holy, righteous standards of God. It should have been clear to everyone listening that God is perfect and that we cannot even come close to meeting his standards. This should have also made it clear that we are sinners in need of a Savior who was able to and did keep all these standards perfectly. The one who came to fulfill the law and prophets, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Last time we saw, in the first part of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus taught on the right and wrong way to judge, and on the attitude we should have in prayer, how we should be persistent in prayer and expect our Heavenly Father to give good things to His children. Now, as Jesus begins to conclude His Sermon on the Mount, He presents His listeners with an option. The narrow gate that leads to life, or the broad way that leads to destruction. In this video, we will finish the Sermon on the Mount series, looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through the rest of the chapter. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14 say, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Notice first that there are only two options, the narrow gate and the broad way. There is no third option, no middle ground, and no neglecting to make a decision. Everyone that ever exists will take one of these two paths. You're either on the narrow path or the wide one. Few are on the narrow path that leads to life, but what exactly is the narrow way? In John 14:6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He also says in John 10, 7 through 9, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus himself is the narrow gate that leads to life. Apart from Christ, we are all on the broad way that leads to destruction because of our sin, and we deserve it. But God, in His love, sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, God incarnate, to live the perfect, sinless life. He is the only one who ever truly lived up to the standards of the Sermon on the Mount perfectly, without fail. The only one to fulfill the Law and Prophets. And then he died in our place and voluntarily took the punishment we deserve for our sin. Then he rose from the dead in victory over sin and death, ascended into heaven and offers us the gift of salvation that he earned for us. To be forgiven and have his perfect righteousness credited to us despite our sin. Salvation is in Christ alone, and only those who turn from their sin and put their faith in Jesus will be saved. This is the narrow gate, and even though it is a free gift from God, it's also the difficult way. It's difficult because it's contrary to everything we knew. The devil, the world, and even our own sinful desires are working against us. That is why the righteous suffer persecution in this world, and it's why Jesus constantly teaches us to deny ourselves, pick up our crosses, and follow Him. It's a difficult path, actually impossible if not for the miraculous work that God does in our hearts. But those whom God has truly saved will persevere and enter through the narrow gate. 
The rest will go through the broad way, the way that doesn't require you to deny yourself and your sin, but rather teaches you to embrace who you are and teaches you that your sin is actually good and should be accepted. The broad way also includes the way of Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Catholicism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, Gnosticism, Agnosticism, Atheism, Universalism, Inclusivism, and any other way besides Christ and Christ alone. Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So not only does the broad way include anything that does not claim faith in Christ alone, but it also includes ways that do claim that, but don't actually mean it. False prophets and false teachings that appear to be leading people in the narrow way that leads to life, but are just deceiving them into the broad way. Jesus goes on to say of these false prophets, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? The fruit of a false prophet is how we identify them. We can see the fruit of their teachings and their lifestyles. Do they really teach the truth of God's word or do they continually twist it and take it out of context to make it mean what they want it to mean? Ezekiel 13.10 says, when speaking of false prophets, that they mislead people by saying peace when there is no peace. False prophets often tell people what they want to hear and make them comfortable in their delusions rather than telling them the truth that would save them. And in their lifestyles, do they really live according to the truth of God's word, or do they condone certain sin or secretly live in hypocrisy contrary to what God's word teaches? Ultimately, it comes down to this. Does this teacher point you to the Lord Jesus, or does this teacher point you to his own gifts or abilities, your own selfish desires, or anything else besides Jesus? It's not always easy to tell because false prophets are deceiving, and just because they mention the name of Jesus a lot does not mean they are pointing you to him. But ultimately, their bad fruit will reveal what they really are, and anyone who follows them is following them on the broad way that leads to destruction. In the next few verses, Jesus goes from speaking of false teachers to speaking of false believers in what may very well be some of the most startling verses in all of Scripture. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. As we've seen previously, salvation is in Christ alone. No amount of good works can ever earn anyone salvation. If you are saved, it's because Jesus earned your salvation. But if you are truly saved, there will be evidence. When God saves a person, that person is forever changed. They go from loving their sin to hating it and striving to put it to death. They go from living for themselves to living for God, following His word because they believe Him and want to please Him. They truly love God because He first loved them. This person bears good fruit, proving that God has saved them. Verse 22 says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Don't be deceived into thinking that just because you go to church, do good deeds, call yourself a Christian, said the sinner's prayer, go on mission trips, or even are a pastor, that you are genuinely saved. None of these things save a person. Many like this will be shocked to hear Jesus say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So as 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? Jesus then concludes his Sermon on the Mount with a parable of a wise man who built his house on the rock and a foolish man who built his house on sand. 
A storm came and hit both houses, but the one built on the rock did not fall because of the firm foundation it was built on. The one built on sand, however, did fall, and great was the fall of it. The wise man whose house was built on the rock represents those who hear Jesus' words and does them. God has saved them and it shows. The fact that they live by God's word proves that they have true faith and are built on the rock that is obedience to God's word, following Christ's teachings. Jesus never promises that those who follow him will never have any storms in life, but rather when they do, they will survive because they obey his word. The foolish man whose house was built on sand represents those who may claim faith in Christ, but live in disobedience to his word. Their disobedience proves that they don't trust in Jesus, but perhaps trust in their good works, church attendance, theology, or anything else. Those who live in constant disobedience to God's word prove that they don't really trust in Jesus. Verses 28 and 29 say, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. How many from this crowd actually believe Jesus' teaching here, we cannot know, but what we do know is that they were shocked at the authority he taught with. Jesus didn't hold back. He got right to the heart of God's word and explained the intentions of scripture and called out sin and superficial obedience. He knew the hearts of men, and he taught the word not as the scribes and Pharisees, but as one who had first-hand knowledge and knew the intentions of God in his word. And only he could do this, being the Son of God himself, God incarnate, the word made flesh. So as we reflect on the Sermon on the Mount, let us understand who it is who gave us this sermon, what he has done for us, and let us truly repent of sin and put our faith in him. Let us live by God's word truly to please this amazing God who saves sinners, rather than to please sinful men who need saving. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, subscribe, and share this video with others. Thanks for watching.